Recording. All right, it is eight o'clock. Um, I'm sure people will keep jumping on as we get going. Um, but let's let's get started on time so that uh, we can respect uh, Brother Mason's time and give him all that uh, all the all the attention and time that that he his he and his subject matter deserves. Um, so welcome everybody to uh, day two of our week long training. Uh, for those of you who are in the Gilbert region, and and welcome to those who are uh, from some of the other regions who are joining us. Um, so as we mentioned yesterday afternoon, uh, the purpose for today, for this morning, is for content mastery to uh, uh, get to listen to those who have paid the scholarly price um, to study some of these um, difficult subjects, especially in church history. Um, so. Uh, we want to uh, invite you to open up the chat feature. Um, please, please submit any questions that you have uh, for Brother Mason to answer um, during the Q&A section. Um, the other members of uh, the Gilbert Region Training Council will, will kind of compile those and will be kind of the mouthpiece <clears throat> for those questions. Um, and, if, and if we need clarification, we may like throw that back on you and and ask you to clarify a little bit uh, if uh, if your question is a little bit hard to understand. So so be prepared to unmute if we ask you to. Um, otherwise, keep yourself muted so that uh, we don't have any background noises. Um, just your typical Zoom etiquette, if you will. Um, if we could start with an opening prayer, Ryan Daly, do you mind saying an opening prayer for us to get us started? Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for this opportunity to come together. Um, we're grateful for the technology that allows it to happen. Um, we pray that the Spirit will be able to um, touch our hearts in a way that um, draws us closer to, to thee and to thy son. Um, we pray that <clears throat> we'll have a, uh, a question um, attitude and be able to, to really push ourselves in, in learning this uh, new material and diving deeper. We're grateful for our speaker, uh, Brother Mason, and pray that uh, um, it'll go well. We love thee, Father, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Thanks, Ryan. Um, so we're going to ask you to kind of consider a couple things. Um, just kind of let this float in the back of your mind. Uh, we'll, we'll debrief when we get back to the building um, at 1030. Uh, but I want you to consider some questions that you currently have. Um, about the subject matter that uh, Brother Mason's going to share with us. Um, pay attention to the questions that maybe you, you have, how, how were they answered, um, and, and in what way is this going to help you um, uh, in the classroom. So just kind of consider some of those things. So I want to introduce uh, Brother Mason. <clears throat> this, is, this is his bio right off of the uh, uh, Utah State University webpage. So um, this is this is what it says. It says Patrick Mason is the author of several books for Latter Day Saint and academic audiences, including the recent titles "Restoration: God's Call to the 21st Century" and "Planted: Belief and Belonging in an Age of Doubt." Um, and if you want a taste for his newest book for for restoration, there's a really great podcast on LDS Perspectives where. Um, Brother Mason talks about some of the ideas in that book. Um, he holds the Leonard J. Arrington Chair of Mormon History and Culture at Utah State University, where he is an Associate Professor of Religious Studies and History. He consulted with the Church History Department on the Gospel Topics essay, Peace and Violence Among the 19th Century Latter-day Saints, and is the author of two books on the subject, Mormonism and Violence, The Battles of Zion and Proclaim Peace, the Restoration's Answer to an Age of Conflict, which will be forthcoming later this year. Um, and at this point, we'll kind of turn the time over to you, Brother Mason, uh, to kind of uh, share what you feel like a bunch of religious educators would benefit most from uh, as we look down the barrel of the second half of Doctrine and Covenants. Right. Thanks, uh, Brother Anderson. Appreciate it. And thanks for having me. 
Uh, appreciate the invitation. I'm uh, grateful for the time difference. So it's nine o'clock here rather than eight o'clock. That was a little uh, act of mercy. Uh, so um, uh, it's it's really good to be with you. And uh, one of my former students is is among you, Mason Isom. So hello, Mason. Um, but uh, I'm 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 grateful to to be here talking about uh, this topic here. Let me uh, I'm going to share my screen here. All right, can y'all see that? Okay. All right, great. Okay, so we're gonna be, we're gonna be talking about this uh, sort of uh, based on, but also expanding upon uh, the gospel topics essay, uh, which uh, which focuses mostly on on the Mountain Meadows massacre, and um, a quick uh, pop quiz for you here. Uh, you're all educators, so I'm sure you do this to your students. So it's good to be subjected to uh, the same techniques every once in a while. Uh, Anybody know off the top of your head, what is the best selling book about Mormonism or Mormon history in this century? In the 21st century, what is the best selling book about Mormonism or Mormon history? Any ideas? And I can't see the chat right now because I'm in, so you can just unmute yourself if you have a guess. Or I can look at the chat. Okay, so we've got a guess, uh, Massacre at Mountain Meadows. Excellent book, uh, but not the right answer. Any other guesses? Best selling book about- Maybe, maybe Bushman's Rough Stone Rolling? Bushman's Rough Stone Rolling is uh, probably the top selling title by an LDS author. Uh, so great guess, also not the correct answer. Anyone else? No Man Knows My History by Fawn Brody. Uh, it still continues, even though it was published in 1945, continues to be a big seller. Uh, not the right answer, all right. So to, so to keep you from being tortured any longer, all right, here, here's the answer, okay? And this is, this is, this is part of the, um, the reason of why we're even gonna talk about this. The number one best-selling book about Mormonism in this century is John Krakauer's book, Under the Banner of Heaven. I don't know if any of you have ever uh, read it, but Krakauer's book, it, for, it was published in 2002, 2003, somewhere around there, right at the beginning of the, the new millennium. Uh, it continues to be, you know, even 20 years later, it's consistently in the top five sellers uh, all the time uh, if, if you look at the Amazon lists of, of top sellers, and it has consistently been so for the past 20 years. So it's easily the best-selling book uh, about, uh, about Latter-day Saints and, and our history in this century. Now, who's reading it? Mostly non-LDS people. It's assigned in a ton of classrooms. It's, it's read by a lot of people. It, for, I, I'm guessing that for a lot of people, if they've only read one book in their lives that have to do with Mormonism, it's probably this one. Uh, and what does Krakauer do? Well, Krakauer focuses on, um, he, he uses uh, the church's history uh, and specifically he, he, he alternates between the church's history and then a contemporary story of Ron and Dan Lafferty and the Lafferty murders from the 1980s um, in which they were inspired by their uh, faith in uh, uh, the, the, the church and their understanding of restoration scripture uh, and their own personal revelations, what they thought were their own personal revelations to, to murder a number of people. Uh, and so Krakauer tells this story and he tells it as a cautionary tale for him. All of, he, he always says, you know, I never set out to, to, to write a book about Mormonism. Uh, he wanted to write a book about religion and violence. This was right after 9-11. Everybody was talking about religion and violence, you know, uh, after those terrorist attacks. So he said, I want to write a book about religion and violence. And what was the case study that he used? He used Mormonism. And so, so tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of readers, I don't know exactly how many copies of this sold, uh, but uh, lots and lots of people all around this country, all around the world, their exposure to Mormonism uh, has been 
through this book, Under the Banner of Heaven, which basically argues that, that Mormonism as a revealed religion is especially prone to violence. And you can see what Krakauer says here. He says that faith is the very antithesis of reason, injudiciousness, a crucial component of spiritual devotion. Common sense is no match for the voice of God. So what Krakauer really has a problem with and what he thinks is really dangerous is this idea of revelation. This idea that God can talk to anyone, anytime, whether it be a prophet, whether it be an ordinary person like a Ron or a Dan Lafferty, and that that voice of God that somebody hears in their head might tell them to go kill somebody. And he uses the Nephi story. He uses a number of examples from LDS history. And he says, that is what's dangerous about religion. He says, at that point, all the ethics, all the rationality, all the common sense, all the laws in the world don't matter because somebody believes that the voice of God is telling them to do something. So this is the number one way, I, I don't think a ton of people inside the church are reading this book necessarily, but, but people outside the book, this is, um, I, I think it's this and the Book of Mormon musical, frankly, uh, which are, which are the, uh, uh, the, the, the two most popular things that, you know, in terms of how, how people get to know uh, Mormonism. So maybe not the most flattering accounts of us, but this is the reality. Uh, the other thing is that um, this idea that religion is inherently violent is central to the new atheist critique of religion in general, not necessarily just of our church and our religion, but of religion in general. And so Christopher Hitchens was, was one of the most prominent and pugnacious of the new atheist authors who was constantly attacking religion. Uh, one of his last books is called uh, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. So he's, he's being nice and subtle there. I'm not exactly sure what his take is. Uh, uh, but his chapter two in that book is called Religion Kills, also not exactly very subtle. And so at the heart of the atheist critique of religion in the 21st century is the idea that religion is inherently violent. Uh, and so, so I think as religious educators and as people of faith, we have to be aware of this. Now, now this may not be the, the conversation that's happening every day or every week, you know, uh, with, within our classes or within our, uh, within our wards, um, uh, because of course we know better. I mean, we, we, we know that that's not the way that, that our religion works on a day-to-day -day basis, but this is the perception by many, many people uh, you know, who are reading books and, and you know, out, outside of our religion. And so I think we have to be aware of that. So that's one reason why this topic matters. I think another reason that, that maybe is more relevant for us inside the church, and especially for, for you as religious educators and for all of us as disciples of Jesus, is that in order for us to exercise faith in God, uh, in order for us to follow Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace, we have to know something about his character. This is what the lectures on faith say, this classic quote that in order that any rational and intelligent being may exercise faith in God unto life and salvation, they must have a correct idea of his character perfections and attributes. So what are the character perfections and attributes of God when it comes to the question of peace and violence? So that's where I think uh, as, as we teach people, as we teach our students who God is, who Jesus is, uh, how God is revealed in the scriptures, uh, uh, this may be, you know, the, the more relevant question, more than anything that Krakauer or Hitchens said, uh, but this may be more relevant as our students actually read the scriptures, which we hope they do, but they're going to encounter a lot of things in the scriptures that may lead to questions about the nature and the character of God. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I think we need to be prepared to be able to talk about that. So, so here's kind of an outline of what I'm going to talk about. Um, uh, and, then, uh, and then what I really look forward to is, is the conversation and, and the questions. So, so we're going to start by, by talking about violence in, in Restoration Scripture. I'm going to focus especially on the Book of Mormon. I'm not going to say very much about the Bible. I'm happy that, that, we can talk, that we could talk about the Bible or any questions you have about the Bible uh, in Q&A, but I'm just going to focus on the Book of Mormon uh, right now. And then I'm going to focus uh, even more of my time on, on violence in uh, LDS history, uh, because that is sort of what you're coming up on here as, as you move towards the second half 
uh, of, of the year. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna suggest that there are sort of four stages that the Latter-day Saints went through in terms of, of our uh, historic relationship with violence. Uh, so I'm gonna walk through uh, all of that. And then at the at the at the end, um, I'll I'll address um, some some pedagogical questions and how we uh, as teachers might think about what it means for us to teach the gospel of peace uh, in worshiping the Prince of Peace, uh, even with this uh, th this history and this context of, of violence that that I'll be talking about. So that's that's kind of where we're going to be going today. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about the Book of Mormon. I I, I think it's uh, I don't think there's any question that at, at this at this moment in LDS history, the Book of Mormon is a kind of first among equals in Restoration Scripture. I mean, we we believe that you know, we have four books of Scripture that are all technically equal, but I think the Book of Mormon, right now at least, has has a place of particular prominence uh, among our people. That hasn't always been the case, but it's I think it's the case right now, uh, and 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 that's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing, but it also raises the question of violence because. This is a book of scripture that is absolutely saturated with violence from beginning to end, from literally the opening chapter where the people of Jerusalem are making an attempt on Lehi's life. And the first, you know, stories of the Book of Mormon are about Nephi's brothers, you know, beating him up. Uh, and then, of course, the Nephi and Laban story. So, so in, in, the, in the first four chapters of the book, violence is a recurring theme. It's actually not entirely dissimilar from the Bible in this respect, uh, where you get, uh, and in a lot of ways, uh, you, you could argue, especially from a Latter-day Saint theological perspective, that the original sin is not necessarily taking the fruit, because we see that as a transgression, not necessarily a sin, uh, but, but maybe the original sin of humanity is violence uh, when, when, when Cain kills Abel. But, um, but anyway, so, so we, we see this in, in the Book of Mormon, that the violence is, is right there from the outset. And I think this is, you know, we talk about the Book of Mormon being scripture for our day and, and scripture that, that, of course, was meant for us in the modern world. And I think there's, there's something to this here because we live in a violent world. Uh, we live, you know, the 20th century was the most violent century in the, in the history of the world uh, in, in terms of loss of life, uh, in, in terms of the amount of mass killing that is done. Fortunately, we haven't had any world wars or anything like that in the 21st century, but this century began with the terrorist attacks in New York and Washington. And uh, we, we've just gone through almost two decades of war as a country in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and then you think you look at what's happening all around the world in different places, you know, recent troubles in Jerusalem and, and Palestine uh, and places. So, so we live in a world of war. And the Book of Mormon is uh, especially attuned to this, which I think is, is actually one of the elements of it being scripture for our day that maybe we don't think about or talk about uh, quite as much. But the fact, you know, so the Book of Mormon, you know, we hear mostly three voices or three narrators in the Book of Mormon, Nephi, Mormon, and Moroni. All of these are men of war. All three of the major narrators in the Book of Mormon, uh, their lives were in many ways defined not only by their uh, prophetic preaching, but also by their involvement in, in war. Uh, unwilling, uh, per perhaps, you know, it found them as much as they uh, found it. Uh, but nevertheless, a significant part of their biography, each of the three of them, uh, has to do with violence, either receiving it or perpetrating it. Uh, th these were men who, who wielded the sword in, in their hands. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, ne Nephi, uh, as, as we know from 2 Nephi chapter 5, the very first thing that he does when the Nephites separate from the Lamanites, the very first thing he does is make swords for his people. Second thing he does is make a temple, um, but uh, but it's uh, so 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 all three of these narrators are uh, violence is is always shaping uh, their lives, and so so how should we think about all this warfare? And of course you have the war chapters in Alma, you have it popping up all over the place, um, and 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 a lot of readers of the Book of Mormon actually, if if they get tired of anything, they get tired of all the war. Uh, in it. And um, so how do we think about it? How do we make sense of all this war? Well, well, there are lots of scholars who have written about this, and, and they each have their different perspectives in terms of like, what is the message that the Book of Mormon is trying to give us? 
uh, in all of this talk about war, is there an overall message? Is there an overall takeaway that we should think about uh, as readers of the, of the text and as disciples of Jesus? Well, I think one thing that most scholars, uh, virtually all that, that I know of would agree on is that the Book of Mormon is very critical of the notion of total war. The Book of Mormon does not have any tolerance uh, for the kind of atrocities that oftentimes happen, that, that usually happen in times of war. Uh, and, and this is all kinds of things. We see this especially at the end of the Book of Mormon, both in the Book of Ether and then uh, in the books of, of Mormon and, and Moroni. The, the torture, the sexual violence, the rape, the, the cannibalism, the, the, the targetings of civilians. I mean, the worst of the worst, the kinds of things that, you know, the, the Geneva Conventions have laws of international warfare meant to regulate these things uh, today. Um, but the Book of Mormon gives absolutely no place to these kinds of things. Doesn't matter who's doing them, Nephites, Lamanites, various factions of the Jaredites, it does not matter. The Book of Mormon absolutely and roundly condemns all of these kinds of atrocities. There is no room uh, in the Book of Mormon for anything like total warfare. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think it's, uh, and, and again, I, uh, most scholars uh, would, would agree on that. I actually don't know of anybody who would, who would disagree with that. Um, but then after that, then there is some disagreement as to, as to what the message of the Book of Mormon is and what kind of warfare, uh, what kind of violence it, uh, it allows for. Uh, there's at least one scholar uh, that I know of who argues that the Book of Mormon uh, gives uh, a doctrinal basis for preemptive warfare, what was known as the Bush Doctrine in the early uh, 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 21st century. This idea that, that sometimes you have to use preemptive, excuse me, preemptive warfare, that you have to uh, kind of go on the offense in order to protect yourself, uh, that, that you might have to invade other countries in order to protect your own. Uh, and, and this scholar pointed to some of the tactics and strategies employed by Captain Moroni and, and some of his lieutenants in arguing that the Book of Mormon uh, makes the case for preemptive warfare. I'm not so convinced by that, and, and I haven't seen a lot of other scholars follow in, in that lead, but, but at least one scholar made a serious argument for that. What I think that the majority of people who read the Book of Mormon and scholars who write about the Book of Mormon, the, the place where they land, is that the Book of Mormon argues for something like the just war tradition. And I won't go into all the details of what that means uh, in terms of sort of Christian history and, and European history and so forth. But, but essentially the just war tradition is this idea that there should be moral guidelines for when, is it, when it's appropriate to fight a war and how a person or, or how a country, or how a group should fight the war. So when and why and, and, and how. Uh, a, a war can be justly uh, fought, recognizing that, that oftentimes war is unjustly uh, done and, and there are all these atrocities, but, but how and when we, can it be just, especially for a Christian uh, to, to enter into war? And, and, and this is where most people point to Captain Moroni and, the, and those famous passages in places like Alma 43 and Alma 46, uh, I think Alma 48, um, where, where it talks about, you know, protecting the family and, and, and religion and their rights and their country and, and their liberties and so forth. This is, you know, kind of title of liberty uh, type stuff. And so a lot of people have, a lot of scholars have gone into detail and says, you know, this is basically the message of the Book of Mormon, that, that for the most part, you know, war is bad. Obviously, we don't do the atrocities that are oftentimes associated with it, but there can be times when, when warfare is necessary and just, especially in self-defense. Uh, and, and the Captain Moroni example is, is the way to think about that. Um, but there's also a whole other way to think about the Book of Mormon that uh, more and more people, and I'm, I would be included in this group, uh, are seeing the Book of Mormon uh, less as an endorsement of violence or of certain kinds of war than rather as a prophetic warning against it. And, uh, and, and reading the book as, as a book length treatise on the futility of war. And actually I think the book of Ether and the Jaredites are, are, are the, the, the best example of this. Well, the whole end of the Book of Mormon where, where you see that these people 
you know, what, re remember what Jesus told Peter in the garden, those who take the sword or live by the sword will die by the sword. This is exactly what happens to the Jaredites. This is exactly what happens to the Nephites and, and Lamanites. Uh, that, that this cycle of violence that begins in the very earliest chapters of the book eventually culminates if, if it's not checked, if it's not stopped, if you don't do anything to address it, it will eventually destroy you and it will destroy your entire civilization. I mean, it was, it was Gandhi who said, you know, an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. And this is exactly what we see in the Jaredite civilization, the inability to show mercy the inability to forgive, the inability to enter into processes of reconciliation, to always focus on vengeance, to always focus on justice, always focus on the fact that we have been wronged and therefore we have to do something about that. Uh, nobody stops the cycle of violence. And what do you get? It literally comes down to, to two people trying to kill each other and, and you know, last man standing. Uh, I don't think that's a happy story, right? Uh, I don't think the Book of Mormon is saying, hey, this is the best way to set up your civilization, people, right? Uh, so I think that the, the whole Book of Ether is a prophetic warning against what happens when we leave violence unchecked, when we don't let the gospel of Jesus Christ with this message of mercy and forgiveness and reconciliation and love, when we put that at arm's length, and instead hold on to grievances and on to vengeance. Uh, and of course, uh, that's only one example that the, the, the centerpiece, of course, of the Book of Mormon is the coming of Jesus uh, uh, to the people of Lehi and his preaching. And I've always said, you know, we, of course, the, as soon as Jesus comes, he teaches the Sermon on the Mount or a, a slight variation of it, the Sermon at the Temple. And so I've always said, you know, Latter-day Saints should take the Sermon on the Mount twice as seriously as anybody else because we have it twice in our scriptures. The rest of Christianity has it once. We have it twice. We should take it twice as seriously. So when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, when he says, turn the other cheek, when he talks about pray for those who persecute you, uh, we as Latter-day Saints should be doubly attentive to those words of Jesus because of all of his teachings, Think of all the things he taught in the New Testament, all of the parables, all of the beautiful sermons, right? I mean, all the things he could have done. And what did he do when he came to, to, yeah, to you know, the promised land here? Uh, he, he taught the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and so, and, and we see what happens in the Book of Mormon because the people, they not only hear the sermon, but they live the sermon. And this leads to 4th Nephi, which is 200 years, nearly 200 years of peace. Where And how did they achieve peace? It was because of the love of God, which did dwell in the hearts of the people. So we know the Book of Mormon shows us both what happens when you allow violence and vengeance and revenge to take root in your heart. You can see that with the Jaredites and with the end of the Nephite civilization. Or what happens when you let the love of God take root in your heart. And we see that in fourth Nephi, uh, uh, this, this Zion society uh, that, that I think uh, if we had our choice, there's no choice of which place we'd rather be in and what we're trying to build as followers of Jesus. Okay, and of course, we also have the example of the anti-Nephi Lehi's, which are this amazing counterpoint. It's, it's one of Mormon's really interesting editorial strategies in the book of Alma. Is to, is to put the anti-Nephi Lehi's and Captain Moroni next to each other, uh, these, these stories. But it's always been interesting to me that when Mormon is on his deathbed, when Mormon has seen the destruction of his civilization, when he has seen millions of people die as a result of the cycle of violence, and he's writing his last lecture, when he's writing his final sermon, what does he say to the surviving Lamanites and to us? His message is to lay down your weapons of war and delight no more in the shedding of blood and take them not again, save it be shall, that God shall command you. Okay? So Mormon has two messages at the end of his life to the Lamanites and to us. He says, basically, believe in Jesus and then to lay down your weapons of war. When more, not, clearly Mormon, for, for Mormon, Captain Moroni had been a hero of his. He'd named his son after him, apparently. Uh, and so 
Uh, but what is going through Mormon's mind as he as he thinks about it and as he nears the end of his life, he doesn't hold up Captain Moroni as the example. He holds up the anti-Nephi Lehi's, so lay down your weapons of war. Uh, that to him is, is what it looks like to follow Jesus. Now, I think one of the other things we have to think about as we read the Book of Mormon is, is the, the, the huge gender imbalance in the Book of Mormon. Uh, and I think more and more of our students are noticing this, more and more of, of especially uh, the, the girls in our classes are noticing this, uh, and I'm glad they are. I'll never forget I had, uh, when, when I taught down at, at Claremont, I had Sherry Dew come and she gave a big public lecture to, to a few thousand people there in one of the big auditoriums there. And she, she talked about women in the priesthood, but, but then she did a Q&A session afterwards. And one of the questions that came up is, uh, why are there so few women and so few women's voices in the Book of Mormon? And it was so great, she, she got the question on a note card, she read it out loud and without skipping a beat in front of these thousands of people, she said, why are there so few women in the Book of Mormon? Because it was written by men, duh, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and so there is, one of the things we see in the Book of Mormon is it's a very male-centric text, even more than the Bible. Um, and, and a lot of scholars, an increasing number of scholars are, are, are saying, is this uh, society that seems to focus and on men's experiences and be so androcentric. Um, is this one of the things that led to the kind of violence that we persistently see in Nephite culture and in Jaredite culture? Um, and, uh, and actually there are a lot of studies today that, sh that show that the societies that uh, pay more attention to gender equality, societies that give women more opportunities for leadership and for voices are generally more nonviolent and generally lead to all kinds of better outcomes uh, for people. So, so there's, there's a growing uh, kind of sensibility that one of the Nephites problems, uh, perhaps, and we see hints of this in, in Jacob's critique of the Nephites and in other places, that the Nephites had a patriarchy problem. Uh, and this may have been uh, connected in some ways to their, to their violence pro problem. So, so that's interesting to think about. Okay. so. The other thing that the Book of Mormon introduces to us and forces us to reckon with, um, I think in a way that is really distinctive is the problem of divine violence. Um, I'm not gonna get into this a ton right now. We can talk about it during Q&A if, if you want to. But I, you know, the Bible introduces the problem of divine violence of, of God smiting people and Sodom and Gomorrah and, and you know, Ananias and Sapphira and, and you know, the, the the, you know, the genocides that are reported in, in Samuel uh, and Joshua and, and places like that. So, so the Bible certainly has its share of violence, uh, and which, which seems to be divinely commanded and mandated. Um, I think the Book of Mormon, uh, again, uh, it, it is remarkable as scripture, just like it, it takes the doctrine that is taught in the Bible and distills it to its essence. This is the reason why we love the Book of Mormon so much because it teaches doctrine so powerfully and plainly. I think it also introduces theological problems to us plainly and uh, straightforwardly. And I think one of the theological problems that it introduces to us is the problem of divine violence. Does God commit violence? Does God kill people? And does God tell people to kill people? And I think the Book of Mormon distills this question to its essence, first of all, in the Nephi and Laban story, where he says, I was constrained by the spirit to do what he did, to chop off Laban's head. And then most of all, I think that, that the most powerful example of this, in, in a lot of ways, the most troubling um, uh, chapter uh, in, in the Book of Mormon, uh, perhaps in all of scripture is third Nephi nine, where, all of these Nephite cities are destroyed by fire, by flood, by earthquake, by all these kinds of things, right? And it's not just saying that it happened, but Mormon reports some, somehow he had access to the first person of Jesus, and it specifically says it's Jesus. It's not the Father. It's Jesus saying, I did this. I was the one who sent down fire to destroy these cities. I was the one who sent the floods. I was the one who, who you know, piled this earth up on top of the cities and all of their inhabitants. I did it. This is the same Jesus who then two chapters later comes down 
says I'm the savior of the world and has people one by one come up and touch the prints of the, of the nails in his hands and in his feet, and then preaches the Sermon on the Mount. So within the space, of, so, so you've got Jesus killing people in 3 Nephi 9, and you have Jesus teaching the Sermon on the Mount and saying, turn the other cheek and blessed are the peacemakers three chapters later. So this introduces in as concentrated form as anywhere else we have in scripture, this challenge and problem of divine violence. And I think a lot of our students notice this, right? They may not quite have the words to articulate why it's a problem, um, but I hope we pause when we read 3 Nephi 9 and recognize that this is a chapter that we have to, we have to deal with. And I think there are lots of approaches, lots of ways that we can think about it and deal with it. Again, I'm happy to talk about it a little bit more uh, later if, if that's something you're interested in. Okay, so all of this to say is that the, that all of this violence in the Book of Mormon uh, brings issues of hermeneutics, just the fancy word for interpretation, uh, to the fore. The Book of Mormon forces us, all of, all of this stuff about violence in the Book of Mormon, it forces us to think seriously about the way that we read and interpret scripture. It's almost as if it grabs us by the lapels and says, think about this stuff, people. Right. I mean, it's it's not just one or two episodes of violence. It is throughout the whole book. It is forcing us to reckon with us. And I'm going to talk about some of this at the end in terms of these things of, of, of reading descriptively versus, versus per, uh, prescriptively, of thinking about the fallibility of scripture and prophets, uh, thinking about intertextuality, the way the different texts bounce off of each other, and, and then what what we do to interpret scripture. So I'm going to, I'm going to save all of this to, to, to the very end, but just to, to kind of uh, get you thinking about this. But I think the Book of Mormon, as scripture intended for our day, that one of the purposes of the Book of Mormon is to force us to be better readers of scripture. It doesn't, it, it, we can be lazy readers of scripture, but the Book of Mormon doesn't want us to be lazy readers of scripture. It wants us to be engaged. It wants us to be morally and ethically engaged. It wants us to be discerning readers. It wants us to wrestle with this, just like Jacob wrestled with the angel. The Book of Mormon wants us to wrestle with, with the text and, and, uh, and to seek wisdom uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so that's that's the Book of Mormon. I have lots more to say about that, but that's that, that'll that do so that we can move on to, to history. Okay, so what I want to do here is is narrate my view, um, uh, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about this and researching it, but uh, but other people could disagree with me. Um, this, this is my view of the way that violence played out in LDS history, especially in the 19th century, but then with a legacy into the 20th century. I see four stages of the way that the early saints um, in the 19th century engaged with, with violence. And the first, excuse me, the first of these stages is essentially pacifism. That for the first uh, three years approximately of the church's history, uh, the saints were consistently and committedly pacifist. All right, and this tracks actually with the early history of Christianity, uh, where it was not just three years, it was actually about three centuries that uh, the vast majority of early Christians um, were, uh, were pacifist. They refused to uh, uh, fight in the Roman army or to enlist in the Roman army. Uh, that was for a couple of reasons. One, it was because of their belief that they should be peacemakers. Also, they didn't want to be uh, idolatrous and offer uh, 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 sacrifices to the emperor, which was required of, of people uh, uh, who did military service back then. So they had a couple of different reasons. But for about the first three centuries of Christianity, the Christians were pacifists. They refused to fight in the army, uh, and uh, they were deeply critical. Uh, in, in fact, the most cited uh, the, the, the scripture that was most frequently taught in the first three centuries of the church was the Sermon on the Mount, and specifically uh, the, the passages, blessed are the peacemaker, turn the other cheek, pray for your persecutors, uh, etc. That was the most commonly used, uh, those were the most commonly used verses in early Christianity. So anyway, there's a parallel to this in, in the early restoration, uh, in, in, the, in the very earliest of years. 
and you all know this because you've been teaching the early revelations the, the the first half of this year that these are revelations that are dripping with millennialism with the expectation that jesus is coming back and he's coming back soon and so the message of those early revelations in 1830, 1831, 1832, consistently over and over and over again is Jesus is coming back, prepare, get ready, send out missionaries, gather as many as you can, build Zion so that you are ready to receive Jesus. There is nothing in those early revelations that gives a fig about politics, or about what's going on around in the, in the rest of the world. It just doesn't care because the only thing that matters is the kingdom of God. The only thing that matters is preparing the earth for Jesus to come back. And so because of that, the, the saints, that's their entire focus. They're not worried about, I mean, they're aware of what's going on po politically. I mean, they're still reading newspapers and, and things like this, but the focus of the revelations, there's no mention of the United States. There's no mention of any of the nations except to condemn them, right? It's like, gather ye out of the nations, gather out of Babylon. And so what we see is the notion as, as the, the doctrine of the gathering emerges, and as the doctrine of Zion is revealed, both through Moses 7 and then through various revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants, Zion is defined as a city of peace. This is true in Moses 7 in the Enoch revelation, where Enoch gathers people together, and they're so great is their righteousness that their enemies are afraid to come against them, right? And that God fights their battles for them. The same language comes up over and over in the early revelations. In section 45, it defines what Zion, the city of Zion, will be like. It calls people to gather to Zion, the new Jerusalem, a land of peace, a city of refuge, a place of safety for saints of the Most High. And there shall be gathered unto it out of every nation under heaven, and it shall be the only people that shall not be at war one with another. The rest of the world will be at war. The rest of the world will be racked with violence, the revelations say. Uh, people's love will wax cold. Uh, but in Zion, this will be the only place where people lay down their arms, just as Mormon said, uh, and come together, and, and Zion will be a city of peace. In section 63, as the saints are moving to Missouri and they're beginning to, to secure lands in western Missouri, uh, the revelation specifically says, you can do this two ways, folks. You can gain these lands either by purchase or by blood. It gives them two options. But the revelation says, if you do it by purchase, that's the way you're supposed to do it. You can do it by blood, but if you do, you will be scourged, you will be hounded, you will be driven out because it says you are forbidden to shed blood. So it's actually a lot like the commandment to Adam and Eve in the garden. It says, I mean, you, you, you can do what you want, but there's going to be consequences. Here in section 63, uh, you know, in, in the Garden of Eden, of course, they, they had this struggle between two good choices. Uh, here, this is not two good choices. It lays out their two choices, but it says, here's the consequences, folks. Uh, you can do it the nonviolent way, or you can do it the violent way. You can try to use violence to secure Zion, but if you do, this is what's going to happen. Uh, and as uh, 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 not to ruin the story, but uh, that, but uh, that the, these prophecies do come to pass. Uh, and in fact, in their own personal lives, in their own personal conduct, uh, the saints uh, show this kind of Christian pacifism, this kind of Christian nonviolence and forbearance. Famously, Joseph Smith, in March of 1832, when he's attacked and tarred and feathered, and he gets up the next day and preaches about forgiveness and mercy, right? Uh, and, and actually, we, we do have some historical accounts, we have some documents that show that that night, uh, some of the saints were starting to gather guns and, and you know, talking about fighting back, and, and Joseph uh, said, no, 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 and, and he set the example, uh, e even after that horrible attack that nearly took his life, uh, preaching about forgiveness. The same thing happened in the summer of 1833, when the, pe when the people in Jackson County attacked the saints, uh, attacked Edward Partridge, uh, and others, same thing. Uh, they did not fight back. Uh, they did not use violence to fight back, which led John Carrill, who was one of the early historians of the church, eventually left the church. Um, but he wrote in his history of the church, he said, up to this point, up until the summer of 1833, the Mormons had not so much as lifted a finger, even in their own defense. So tenacious were they for the precepts of the gospel, turn the other cheek. 
In other words, the earliest saints, they were so committed, just like the saints in 4th Nephi, just like the saints in Moses 7, they were so committed and converted to the gospel of the Prince of Peace that they would not even lift a finger in their own self-defense because they trusted in God to fight their own battles. Well, at, at a certain point, that's just really hard to do, right? When you keep getting punched in the face, when your homes are burned down, uh, when you keep getting tarred and feathered, when you're when you're driven, you know, uh, you know, and persecutions keep coming. It it is turning the other cheek is hard. There's there's a reason we call it the hard sayings of Jesus. Uh, it's very hard. And so, beginning in the summer of 1833, we begin to see the saints turn to self-defense. They turn away from this kind of strict pacifism and they turn towards self-defense. And one of the revelations that they receive, section 98, this is the key revelation in terms of the Lord's guidance to the modern church on questions of violence and war and peace. Section 98 is the revelation. Um, I'm going to talk about a few of the principles here. I'm happy to talk about it more during, during Q&A because it really is the revelation on this topic. Here are the basic principles. The, the Lord calls this an immutable covenant at the beginning of section 98. So he is talking in covenant language when he reveals these principles to the saints in section 98. This is after the saints have been driven out. So Joseph Smith, he doesn't know all the details, but he's getting word about what's going on in Jackson County. He asks God what they're supposed to do, and he receives this revelation, section 98. The first principle is to renounce war and proclaim peace. This is the command of the Lord to his church in the modern days, to renounce war and proclaim peace, period. Then he tells, he, he outlines two different laws, one a law for individuals and one a law for, for, family, or for, for groups. One is for individuals and families, one is for groups and nations, okay? The principles are very similar. There, there are some slight, de slight differences between the two, but the overall principles are very similar. The Lord tells the saints that when they are attacked, they are to bear it patiently, Okay. Again, this is the same kind of language, the same principles of the Sermon on the Mount. It says that, that, that when they are attacked the, the, the first time, they are to bear it patiently. It then says uh, they're to offer forgiveness, they are to offer reconciliation, they're, uh, but it says after the third time, so if your enemy continues to attack you, if you continue to to, to respond nonviolently, if you continue to bear it patiently, then after three of these attacks, uh, these unwarranted attacks, then it says, thine enemy is in thine hands, and thou art justified in fighting back in self-defense. Now, I think this, and, and, it, and the, the revelation uses this language of justification over and over and over again. If you, if you look at those verses in section 98, this is kind of in the middle of the section, it uses the language of justified and justification over and over and over. This is not just kind of a one-off word that's used casually. This is an intentional word that the Lord uses over and over and over again, justified, justified, justified. I think this is, takes us into theological territory. What does it mean for something to be justified? And this is where we have to think about uh, Pauline theology, especially from the New Testament, and you all know this, the difference between justification and sanctification. They're different. They're related concepts, but they're different. What does it mean to be justified? It means that an act or a behavior that is inherently wrong is made right through the mercy and grace of God, through the atonement of Jesus. So for an act to be justified, it means that the act itself was originally not righteous. It has to be made just through God's grace. Okay, This is the difference between an act that needs to be justified and an act that is sanctifying. If something is sanctifying, it is inherently holy. It is inherently righteous. It is inherently godly. Okay, a sanctified or sanctifying act doesn't need to be justified because it's already holy. But a, an act that has to be justified, and, and, and Paul lays this out, especially in the epistle to the Romans, but in all of his theology, we are justified as sinners 
We are justified by the grace of Christ. It does not mean that our actions, our sins are righteous. It means that we are made righteous through his grace. This is the language of section 98. It says that after repeated attacks, after you've been punched in the face all these times, after you've had your homes burned and after you've been driven out, after multiple attacks in which you uh, showed forbearance, in which you showed patience, after multiple attacks, you will be, you are justified. God will make it right if you choose to fight back. But it immediately says the preference is still to forgive. The preference is still to forbear. And your reward will be even greater if you do. So you are, so the Lord tells the saints they will be justified by turning to self-defense. He will make it right. He will excuse them for doing so. It is not the inherently righteous thing to do because he tells them it is still better if you don't. It is still better if you turn the other cheek. It is still better if you forbear. This is the message of section 98. This is the Lord's law to the modern church when it comes to, to violence, especially to the violence that they receive innocently as victims of it. So, so a lot rests on this theology of justification and sanctification. Uh, when, when we read section 98, because the Lord is clearly using that kind of theological framework. But the basic premise uh, that, that he gives us uh, the, in the modern church is renounce war and proclaim peace. And you're going to see uh, that, the, that the modern church, the prophets and apostles will come back to that language repeatedly because they recognize that the Lord's command to the modern church is to renounce war and proclaim peace. Okay, well, after receiving this revelation, um, uh, and you know, I could talk all day about section 98, but, but, but we need to move on. So, so after receiving this revelation, and after all of the depredations in Jackson County that the saints had encouraged, they, they, they wrote a letter to the governor and they said, we've borne enough. I mean, we, we have turned the other cheek. We, we've tried our best, but, but we're done with being punched in the mouth. Uh, and so the, the saints take up arms. Uh, and again, I think as we look at the history, I think we look at the, at the repeated persecutions that they had received at this point, the way that they had forbeared, uh, or forbore, for, forbeared, whatever the past tense of that is, uh, uh, they had repeatedly done that with patience, the exact way that the revelation laid out. And so I think we can say theologically that they were justified, again, which is different than being sanctified, but they were justified in doing so, they, so they take up arms in November of 1833, and this is the first violent skirmish between the saints and between the Missourians. And actually, the deal that they had struck with the, the people of Jackson County in the summer of 1833, they were going to give them the rest of the year and then into the spring to get ready to move. Well, after the saints take up arms, the, the people in Jackson County say, hey, you, you broke the terms of the deal, so get out of here now. So the saints have to, are expelled immediately from Zion, from Jackson County, whereas that originally the idea is that, that they would have you know until the spring to do so. So they're expelled from Jackson County, and in 1834, as Joseph Smith gets all the news and asks the Lord what to do, uh, this leads to the formation of Zion's camp. Now I think we have oftentimes understood and taught the history of Zion's camp as this kind of military, this, this divinely ordained military campaign to reclaim the land of Zion. That was certainly the way that it was understood by many of its more militant participants. There were actually other participants uh, who were on Zion's camp who, who said, uh, like, I was not all that interested in taking up arms or fighting against the people of Missouri, but, but I was, you know, I, I went along because I thought it was the, the, the right thing to do, okay? But if you look carefully at the Zion's camp revelations, at section 101, section 103, section 105, if you look at these revelations, at no point does the Lord command Zion's camp to engage in violence. At no point. In fact, the Lord, the only loss of life that is referred to in those revelations is the saint's own loss of life. Because we know that this happens sometimes when you, uh, when, when, when you're, a, you know, obviously uh, when you're in this kind of life and death situation, pe people do die. The only loss of life that is referred to in those revelations is the saint's own loss of life. 
they were to achieve victory. They were to redeem the land of Zion, the revelation said, through their diligence, faithfulness, and prayers of faith, not through the force of arms. At the time, a lot of members of the camp did not understand these revelations. I think through the history of the church, the way that we've taught Zion's camp, we have not closely read the revelations. Go back and read them and feel free to prove me wrong. But I've read these revelations a lot. I do not see any place where the Lord specifically commands them and mandates them to commit violence in order to redeem the land of Zion. In fact, in section 105, which culminates the whole Zion's camp experience, the Lord says, I do not require at their hands to fight the battles of Zion. I will fight your battles. So even Zion's camp, which is this example that we oftentimes look at and, and that opponents of the church have oftentimes looked at in terms of this kind of militarism within early Mormonism. In fact, the revelations, it did command them to go to the land of Zion, to redeem the land of Zion it, and, and, and so forth, but it did not give them license to kill Missourians, in, to shed blood in order to redeem Zion. That is not how Zion is established. In fact, the revelation which culminated it said once again that they were to proclaim peace. That the, the Zion's camp, their purpose was to lift up an ensign of peace, make a proclamation of peace unto the ends of the earth, make proposals for peace unto those who have smitten you. Okay. And, and a lot of this, uh, by the way, if you're interested in reading more about this stuff, I, I have an essay which kind of outlines all of this, and it's in the, the most recent. Um, Sydney, Sp uh, Sydney Sperry Symposium, easy enough for me to say, a uh, book that was published this, this year, How and What You Worship, uh, Christology and Praxis in the Revelations of Joseph Smith. I have an essay in here which sort of outlines all of this that, 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 I'm, that I'm talking about here. Okay, so but this, the saints at this point had turned to self-defense to the point that, of course, we get uh, the, the Missouri or Mormon War of 1838. And this, of course, is, is one of the, the, the low points of early church history because of, of the horrific things that happened there. I think as we teach this history, I think it's essential that we recognize that, yes, the saints had been persecuted for years. The saints had been driven from Jackson County. Horrible things had been done to the saints. They were innocent victims in much of this dynamic in Missouri, but they were not entirely innocent. Their hands were not entirely clean. They were not uh, passive victims, especially when it came to 1838. As soon as Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon and other leaders of the church arrive in Missouri from Kirtland after all of the dissensions and apostasies in Kirtland and so forth that forced them out and forces the church leadership to move to Missouri uh, that summer, almost as soon as they arrive, trouble starts and Sidney Rigdon is at the heart of it. He gives this sermon, uh, and again, I, I understand the psychology. I mean, Joseph Smith had almost been killed again in Kirtland, but this time by insiders, by dissenters, by apostates within the church, as they were called. Um, and so Sidney Rigdon gets to Missouri, and he, he gives this fire and brimstone sermon in June of 1838 called the Salt Sermon. And, and he's referring to, to the Savior's teaching that uh, if the salt has lost its savor, it's good for nothing except to be cast out. And Sidney Rigdon used, applied that to dissenters within the church. And he says, they're like salt that has lost its savor, and so they should be cast out. And he uses this very militant language against dissenters within the church. Then on July 4th, he gives, they have a, a celebration to lay the cornerstone of the, uh, the foundation of the Far West Temple. And Sidney Rigdon again gives the, the, the main address there, the main sermon. And he gets, at, at first it starts out fine, but by the end of it, he is getting whipped up. He's getting riled up. And this is what he says. That mob that comes on us to disturb us, it shall be between us and them a war of extermination. For we will follow them till the last drop of their blood is spilled, or else they will have to exterminate us. We oftentimes talk about Governor Boggs' extermination order and how horrible that is, and it is horrible. There's nothing like it in the entire history of the United States, where the chief executive of a state 
issued an extermination order based on religious identity. There's nothing like it in, in all of US history. We're a religious minority. There's been official state sanctioned pogrom against them, an extermination order. So it is singular. Governor Boggs's name should live in infamy throughout US history. But he wasn't the first one to use the language of extermination. The saints did. It was Sidney Rigdon who used the language of extermination first uh, in the summer of 1838. After this, be largely because of Sidney Rigdon's inflammatory rhetoric about dissenters within the church, you saw the rise of, of a paramilitary group within the church called the Danites. This is a really controversial group. Uh, historians have written a lot about this group. But essentially, the Danites, they, they were a paramilitary group uh, within the church. They saw themselves as kind of the ultimate protectors of and guardians of the faith, uh, this kind of extreme militant group within the church. Um, and they said that they would enforce this um, by, by, by the, you know, at the point of a gun. And they wrote a Danite manifesto, which was aimed toward dissenters. They actually named a number of people. And they said, get out of here, depart, leave your communities, leave your homes, or a more fatal calamity shall befall you. So the Danites were organized, first of all, with the idea of, of driving out and intimidating dissenters within the church. Later on, when violence started between the saints and the Missourians, then the Danites got involved in that violence as well. There's a lot of debate about whether Joseph Smith was behind the Danites, how much he knew about it. I think the historical consensus that, that I tend to agree with is that Joseph Smith knew of the Danites. He, he attended uh, some of the early meetings of the Danites. He certainly knew of their existence. I also think it's fair to say that he did not know of all of their activities and he wasn't brought into the loop of especially some of their more extreme actions during the conflict that fall. Um, but he certainly knew they existed. And um, as a result of all of this, this, this heightened militant language, this very violent language, this, this language of, you know, of death, literally death threats against dissenters in the church, this is what led Thomas Marsh and Orson Pratt, two of the apostles, including the president of the Quorum of the Twelve, Thomas Marsh, to leave the church. We tell this story about milk, strippings, and all this kind of stuff with Thomas Marsh. The, the reason why Thomas Marsh and Orson Pratt left the church in 1838 is because they looked around, they saw what the Danites were doing, they heard the kinds of messages coming out of the church, the kind of militancy, the kind of violent rhetoric, and they said, this is not Christianity. This is not what we signed up for. This is not what Jesus taught. And they said, we're out of here. Now they turned around and wrote and signed an affidavit, which was used against the saints. And, and so I think one of the reasons why we have not looked, I mean, we generally don't look kindly on anyone who leaves the church and dissent from the church. Uh, we use words like apostates and so forth. Um, so, uh, but, it, but I think it's because of this affidavit, which was used against the saints, was used in, in uh, you know, when, when uh, Governor Boggs wrote the extermination order, he used the affidavit as evidence of this. So, so there is that associate with Thomas Marsh and Orson Pratt. But the reason they left the church, it wasn't over milk, uh, primarily, it wasn't over these kinds of these things, you know, being offended with it. It was, the, it was the fact that they saw the church taking a violent turn that they could not condone because of their own personal Christian values. Um, so I, I think we can maybe speak a little more charitably um, about Thomas Marsh and Orson Pratt. They had real reasons to leave the church. I'm not sure that uh, how I would feel at, at the time if I saw Danites operating all around me and the kinds of statements were being made. Um, I'm not sure that that was the church that I would have signed up for either. Um, and so we, so, we, so we see the, an escalation of, of tension and the violence that summer and fall leading, in, leading to violence, especially in October. Uh, Joseph Smith gets wrapped up in a lot of this militant language saying that God is going to send his angels to deliver us. We can take out 10,000 as easily as we can take out 10. Um, uh, it culminates in the Battle of Crooked River where the saints, where this, which is a pitched battle between the saints and between the Missouri militia, uh, which they thought was a mob. There's lots of confusion. 
Um, it's a confusing time to be sure in October and, and nobody's quite sure who's an official militia, who's just a mob. Uh, those were kind of blurry boundaries. But anyway, one, one the, the saints killed a member of the state militia. Uh, three Mormons were killed and that including David Patton, one of the apostles. But this is what led Governor Boggs to issue the extermination order. He, he said, now Boggs was an anti-Mormon from all the way back to 1833. Boggs uh, was, was not a neutral party uh, by, any, by any sense. But the Battle of Crooked River gave Boggs the excuse he needed and was looking for to issue this extermination order to expel the saints from Missouri. It was because of this violence, this pitched battle uh, between the saints and the Missourians. Uh, and then, of course, the horrific massacre at Hans Mill that came three days later when, when this Missouri mob came and just horrifically uh, killed young and old uh, indiscriminately. Um, uh, women were raped in Missouri. I mean, th there were, it's, it's, it's horrific to, to, to think about what was done to the saints, but the saints weren't innocent here. They formed their own militia. They burned houses. They burned stores. They attacked people in places like Millport and Gallatin. Um, so this, this was a war with, with people taking up arms on both sides. The, the, the saints were not just passive victims here. Clearly, the, the lion's share of wrongs were done against them, um, but they were not innocent. And at least as I, you know, it's easy to look, I mean, I, I wasn't there. It's easy, it's easy to, to, to make judgments in hindsight. So, so I think we should do so with generosity and charity. But still, it's hard for me not to see a fulfillment of the prophecy that the Lord had already given the saints in section 63. He had told them, wherefore the land of Zion shall not be obtained, but by purchase or by blood. Those are your two options. Otherwise, there's none inheritance for you. If by purchase, so if you do this legally, if you buy the lands, if you do this nonviolently, behold, you are blessed. And if by blood, as you are forbidden to shed blood, lo, your enemies are upon you. And ye shall be scourged from city to city and from synagogue to synagogue, and but few shall stand to receive an inheritance. This, is, this prophecy came true exactly, precisely, in the fall of 1838, tragically. Okay, so let's fast forward. Let's get to Utah, and, and uh, I've got more bad news for you, and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up and turn it around, uh, hopefully on some, some better news. But, uh, but it's, it's, it's not a happy story here. Uh, once, once the saints get to Utah. I think we have to recognize um, that the settlement of Utah uh, was done uh, by displacing the native peoples who lived here. Uh, the, you know, the saints always had this theology of the redemption of the Lamanites, this idea of going into the Western lands and preaching the gospel to the Lamanites, but that pretty quickly ran into the realities of water and food and the necessities and, and, and stolen cattle and, and things like this. And uh, so of course the saints first come to the Salt Lake Valley in 1847. One of the first places they settle is down in Utah County. There are some minor <coughs> skirmishes between the saints and the native uh, peoples there, the Utes uh, in 1848 and 49, but it comes to a head in 1850 uh, where we start to see escalating violence over first of all, a stolen shirt of all things. Um, but eventually um, the leadership of the church holds a war council in 1850 in Salt Lake. And Brigham Young says at that council, uh, so Parley Pratt, uh, who's in the council is advocating uh, to get rid of the Indians, to exterminate them, again, using that language. And Brigham Young essentially says it's kind of us or them. They must either quit the ground or we must. If we don't kill those lake utes, they will kill us. And so uh, they send a militia down, they, they, they organize the military and we start to see uh, organized violence uh, between the saints and the native peoples. That leads to some horrific things. That year there was a massacre at a place called Table Rock where 11 ute warriors are killed, or they're, they're executed, they had surrendered um, and then they were executed, uh, they were beheaded their heads are sent to Salt Lake for science. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that's going on. This is, um, this is not happy stuff. And this is the beginning of the systematic removal 
uh, Native Americans from all the areas where whites wanted to settle. So they never, of course, completely got rid of Native Americans in, in what becomes Utah Territory. Um, some people advocated for that, for, for complete removal. That never happens, but they're removed to reservations out of the places where whites wanted to settle. Um, and so all of the, the various tribes uh, in Utah and in other places of, of Mormon settlement, just like happened throughout the rest, the Mormons are not unique here. Uh, this happens in every place around the West, wherever there are white settlers, uh, that the native peoples are violently displaced. And we oftentimes talk about how Brigham Young was more benevolent towards the natives uh, than, than other Western settlers, his policy that it's cheaper to feed them than to fight them. Well, he comes up with this policy beginning in 1853, 1854. In other words, after the saints had already used violence to, to begin to displace the natives from the places where the saints wanted to settle. So, so it is true that, that Brigham Young adopted a more benevolent policy and tried to, to promote good relations uh, between the saints and the Indians. And on the whole, after this, that, 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 that is true, uh, but it's predicated on the fact that, uh, that there could only be good relations between them if the Indians were removed from the places where the, the Mormons wanted to settle. And then you, you continue to see uh, sporadic conflicts and then horrific things like the Circleville Massacre uh, where 16 Paiutes are, are killed. And so, look, when it, when it came down to it, you know, although, although the saints had lofty ideas about the redemption of, of the Lamanites, there were occasional intermarriages. There were some who were converted uh, to the gospel. Uh, on the most part, it is a story that looks a lot like the rest of the West. Um, where the native peoples are displaced uh, and tremendous violence um, uh, against them. And so, so that's, that's part of the reality of, of the story we have to, to tell about uh, pioneers. Uh, the 1850s was not a great decade, uh, I have to say, for, uh, for, for, for the saints. A lot of the, the things that I, that I think um, are most regrettable of, uh, in our history are related to, to the 1850s. And part of that includes uh, not only violence against the native peoples of this region, but also violence against dissenters. Brigham Young, he, he would alternate. Sometimes he had very harsh words for dissenters, talking about how he was going to pull out his Bowie knife and he'd cut their throats. Other times he would say, look, if you want to leave, just go, you know, like just 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 go and, and you've got my best feeling. So, so Brigham Young, as you all know, he could be mercurial. mercurial. Uh, he, he, was, uh, he, could, he, could, he could use very violent rhetoric or, or peaceful rhetoric. Um, there were a handful of dissenters who were killed here in Utah Territory uh, during the mid 1850s. Uh, Jesse Hartley, um, the, the Parrish Potter murders in Springville. Uh, you know, and so, so there are a handful of cases um, where, where dissenters from the church uh, are killed. Um, the best evidence we have, uh, we don't know as much as we'd like to. Uh, certainly Brigham Young knew about a lot of these murders. Uh, it's unclear whether he ordered any of them. I don't know of any evidence that, that specifically shows that he directly ordered any of them, but he certainly knew about a lot of them and he never punished anyone uh, for, for some of this violence. This is also the time in which the doctrine of blood atonement emerges and is taught publicly and repeatedly by members of the church during the, the, the during by leaders of the church during the, the so-called Reformation of 1856 and 57. Brigham Young thought that the saints were getting too lax in their practice. You know, they'd been here in the valleys for about 10 years now. He thought they were getting a little too fat and happy. And so he instituted this reformation to, to really renew their spirituality. People were getting rebaptized, but 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 the you know the preaching like Jedi. Jedediah Grant and others were going up and down the territory with real kind of fire and brimstone preaching. And one of the things that was taught repeatedly during this time was the doctrine of blood atonement. Uh, this idea can be traced back to Joseph Smith um, in some forms, but, uh, but it's really Brigham Young and other leaders of the church at the time who developed this idea. And the idea is that there are certain sins that are so grievous, that are so serious, that a person must shed their own blood in order to pay for them, that the blood of Jesus is not enough, right? Uh, this is not good theology, by the way. This is not good Christian theology. But this is what was taught repeatedly, that, that, that the blood of Jesus was not enough that a person would have to shed their own blood 
as a sacrifice uh, to expiate their sins uh, that, that were so serious, that offended God in such a serious way. Now, we do not, the blood atonement was taught regularly and repeatedly, uh, especially during this time period. We do not have any conclusive cases that anybody uh, was blood atoned. Uh, we have some journalistic accounts that actually turn out to have been proven wrong in terms of, you know, journalists saying, oh, there's all these people being blood atoned in Utah. Uh, a, a lot of that stuff we can prove to be wrong. There's a couple of cases where, where a couple people might have been inspired by this preaching to commit suicide. Um, it's a little unclear because we don't always know what's going on in their head, but there, there, there is some evidence to point in that direction. Uh, but it's not like the people are going around and, and just being blood atoned left and right. But this was a teaching of the church by many church leaders during this time period. Again, I think we can say in retrospect, it's bad theology. And even at the time, I think most saints knew that it was bad theology because for the most part, they heard it, they kind of shrugged their shoulders and they didn't do it. Um, and so, uh, so I think we can see this as, as preaching sort of run amok uh, uh, by, by some of the leaders of the church. But fortunately, I think the general body of the church and the spirit uh, acted as a kind of corrective to, to, this, uh, to this teaching. Okay, let me move forward uh, so I can wrap up and we'll have time for, for questions. Okay, in addition to violence against Native Americans and violence against uh, dissenters, there was also violence against so-called Gentiles uh, in uh, Pioneer Utah, especially in the 1850s. And a lot of this stems from the anger that came from Joseph Smith's death. Uh, in the Council of 50 that met right after Joseph Smith was murdered, uh, you had statements like from Brigham Young saying, let the damn scoundrels be killed, let them be swept off from the earth. I apologize for the language. Uh, as, as one of my uh, friends, John Turner, who wrote a biography of Brigham Young, he said, I only swear when I'm quoting Brigham Young. So, so, so that's my policy too. I only swear when I'm quoting Brigham Young. But, um, but, uh, but the, the, there's an oath of vengeance that's, that's part of the temple ceremony for a long time uh, in which uh, as part of the ceremony, people prayed that the blood of the prophet, that God would avenge the blood of the prophets. Um, that's no longer part of the ceremony, of course. Um, there was, uh, we, we see the Utah War in 1857 and 58, where because of reports of the saints' disloyalty and theocracy and all kinds of things, President Buchanan sends out the U.S. Army to quell the rebellion in Utah. Fortunately, it's resolved without, without much bloodshed on either side. Um, but, but the saints are really worked up uh, during this time period. And what we see happen as a result of this is the single worst day in Mormon history. September 11th, uh, you know, whether the universe has a sense, a dark sense of humor or not, but this happens on September 11th, 1857, when settlers in Southern Utah led by John D. Lee and other local leaders of the church, including Isaac Haight, with the knowledge of uh, who was the stake president, with the knowledge of uh, uh, William Kling, uh, Smith and others. So this was done under the direction and supervision and knowledge of local church leaders uh, that the militia was called, called out and uh, they kind of snookered the, the, the Paiutes, the local Indians to help them. And they killed 120 men, women and children, emigrants uh, to California, killed them in cold blood. Um, and, and, and the book, uh, Massacre at Mountain Meadows by uh, Rick Turley, Ron Walker, and Glenn Leonard is by far the best book on this. Well, Juanita Brooks' book is terrific too. Those are the two that I'd recommend. Um, that just shows how um, otherwise good people, you know, th these, are, these are people who had sacrificed a lot, who had, you know, were sacrificing a lot to settle in Southern Utah. These were people who were doing their best to live the gospel. Um, how events and attitudes, uh, took on a life of their own uh, that led to this horrific, inexcusable, unchristian act uh, of, of this massacre. 120 men, women, and children killed in cold blood. Uh, President Eyring has, has gone and other leaders of the church have gone you know, to commemorate the, the memorial there at, at Mountain Meadows uh, and, and to recognize and acknowledge that what was done there that day is the exact opposite of the teachings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But this is part of our history. Uh, this is, it, this, these were faithful church members who did this, uh, doing what they believe 
at the moment was was right uh, and of course was horribly wrong. And I think what we see here is, is a people who were traumatized. Uh, Irvin Thaub is a social psychologist who writes a lot about violence and, and he says unhealed psychological wounds can under certain conditions lead some former victims to become perpetrators. This thing we have to remember <clears throat> about the saints that they were a traumatized people. They, they were repeat victims of persecution and violence. And so victimization and trauma, he says, can become central to the group's history, identity, and orientation to the world. Uh, and I think this is one of the things we have to wrestle with is the kind of persecution narrative and the persecution complex that we have. Do we teach our history as one primarily of persecution? in which we are always the innocent victims and the outside world is always out to get us? Or do we recognize that the history is a little messier than that? And that, uh, that even victims can become perpetrators when they lose sight of the principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, to wrap up the story, by the end of the 19th century, uh, the, the, the church had completely turned away from all of these practices and things of, of the middle of the 19th century. And in fact, there's an official declaration of the church. We always talk about the manifesto in 1890 that, uh, that gave up plural marriage, technically. Uh, it took a little while for that to actually happen. Uh, but the year before, in 1889, the First Presidency and Twelve Apostles came out with another official declaration, one that we don't talk about very much, one that wasn't put in the Doctrine and Covenants. And this is the one, this is more about politics. And it says, we don't believe in theocracy anymore. We don't do that anymore. And it also says this church views the shedding of human blood with the utmost abhorrence. It denied that apostates had ever been killed in Utah. That was not entirely factually correct. Uh, they denied the doctrine of blood atonement. So it's the first presidency and the 12 apostles specifically renounced that doctrine uh, that had been taught in the mid 19th century. And, um, and so this is a, a sort of a renunciation of a lot of those practices and teachings of the 1850s. Uh, this comes in 1889. And then what we see is, is that the, the saints, they shift their violence. So, so we all know the Latter-day Saints are not by and large pacifists. So instead we, we shifted our violence and said that violence is appropriate when the state says it's appropriate. It is lawful when the state says so. Uh, and this begins with the Spanish-American War, which is the first American war that the Latter-day Saints uh, participate in. There were outspoken critics of the war at the time, Brigham Young Jr., who was one of the members of the Quorum of the Twelve. He was silenced by the First Presidency. Um, and what we see is a pattern ever since that in between wars, the, the church leaders teach consistently about peace. Uh, but then any time that the United States enters a war, uh, then they, they support it. And this rationale is laid out in a first presidency statement in 1942. So this was David O. McKay was president of the church. And it's a long statement. It's, a, it's, it's actually a very thoughtful statement. Um, but this is the essence of what President McKay and the first presidency said during the middle of World, World, World War II. He said, the church is and must be against war. It cannot regard war as a righteous means of settling international disputes. So the church is always against war as the church. But it says the church membership are citizens or subjects of sovereignties over which the church has no control. When therefore constitutional law obedient to these principles calls the manhood of the church into the armed service of any country to which they owe allegiance, their highest civic duty requires that they meet that call. So in this statement, which is the most definitive statement by the First Presidency ever on, the, on these issues, it draws a distinction between the church itself, which must always be against war as the church of Jesus Christ, but then the individual members of the church because they are citizens of nations and we believe in being subject, right? What is that? The 12th article of faith, 11th, whatever it is, um, that, um, that that means that they can and are justified in responding to that call as part of their civic duty. In general, uh, the church uh, leadership has been critical uh, uh, towards conscientious objectors, although the church does allow for members of the church to become conscientious objectors. They just have to do so on their own accord. They can't do so. Uh, they can't say, oh, because I'm a Latter-day Saint, I'm automatically a conscientious objector. They have to uh, they have to come up with their own reasons and rationales. Okay, 
So all of this to say, and I'll wrap up really quickly, uh, sorry, I've been going for so long, um, that uh, there is also a peace tradition among the Latter-day Saints. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, wards throughout Utah would have an annual peace celebration. They'd have a peace day. They would give sermons and sing hymns that were all dedicated to peace. Um, uh, there's some there's some really fun research about this. J. Reuben Clark, who was a longtime member of the First Presidency, was a was a very committed pacifist. He gave a sermon in general conference. This is remarkable. After the atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he said this was the crowning savagery of the war. He said this was fiendish butchery for us to drop those those bombs. He said that in general conference. Uh, the first presidency put out a statement in 1945. This was now um, uh, George Albert Smith. Oh, previously I'd said it was David O. McKay who was president of the church for the 1942 statement. It was actually Heber J. Grant. David O. McKay was a counselor in the first presidency. In 1945, it was now George Albert Smith who was uh, president of the church. They put out a statement when the U.S. was planning a um, uh, that there was legislation proposed for a mandatory draft, uh, and the first presidency opposed that and said what this country needs and what the world needs is a will for peace, not war. And maybe the most uh, striking statement by a president of the church uh, came in 1976, actually in the, in, the, in the issue of the ensign that was celebrating the bicentennial of the country. The, the message of the first presidency was by President Kimball, who was president of the church at the time, who just gave this striking condemnation of militarism. He said, we are a warlike people speaking of the saints easily distracted from our assignment of preparing for the coming of the Lord. When threatened, we become anti-enemy instead of pro-kingdom of God. We train a man in the art of war and call him a patriot, which he says is a counter, Satan's counterfeit of true patriotism, perverting the Savior's teaching, love your enemies, bless them that curse you. Our assignment is affirmative, to carry the gospel to our enemies that they may no longer be our enemies. Uh, remarkable, remarkable stuff. Okay, so what do we do with this as educators? I'll do this real quickly. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for going so long. Well, how, how do we, I, I think a few things. How do we teach the war chapters in the Book of Mormon? Do we glorify the violence? Do we use it uh, as a way, uh, do, do, do we any way celebrate the violence as cool? Um, do we give any signals to our students that this is the really exciting stuff in the Book of Mormon? Um, my experience is that there's a huge gender gap, uh, not universal, but there's a huge gender gap in terms of the way that men and women read the Book of Mormon. My experience has been that women uh, are bored by the war chapters and are not sure what use they have. And men who are conditioned by our culture uh, I get really excited by these stories of tactics and generals and armies and javelins thrust through people's hearts and things like this. Um, and so I think as educators, maybe we should be mindful uh, about what do we want our students to get out of these chapters? And maybe do the, do the women and girls in our classes um, maybe pay a little more attention to their uh, lack of use for these chapters and skepticism towards these chapters rather than our boys' excitement uh, over flashing swords and marching armies and things like that. Um, I think another thing we can do is help our students, and this is really important, to learn to read scripture de descriptively versus prescriptively. In other words, when is scripture simply describing things that happened and not necessarily endorsing them, right? The, the scripture includes lots of horrible things in it, you know, in, in all of the scriptures, in the Bible and the Book of Mormon, right? Uh, examples that we are not to follow. The reason why those examples are given there is for us to, to, to do better from. And so we need to be better readers of scripture and teach our students to be better readers of scripture to figure out which parts are meant to be descriptive of simply what happened versus prescriptive in terms of what the Lord wants us to learn from these and the things that the Lord is specifically teaching us. And I always go back to what Moroni taught in Mormon chapter 9, condemn me not because of mine imperfection, neither my father because of his, 
neither of them who have written before them, but give thanks unto God that he's made manifest unto you our imperfections, that ye may learn to be more wise than we have been. Moroni gives us license to read the scriptures critically, to say that not everything in the scriptures is the way it's meant to be, to recognize the imperfections even of the prophets. And why? Because this isn't the Church of Mormon or the Church of Moroni or the Church of Joseph Smith or the Church of Russell Nelson. This is the Church of Jesus Christ. And so we are given scriptures to learn not only what we're supposed to do, but also to learn from their mistakes. And Moroni says, you will see these imperfections and you're not supposed to imitate them. You're not supposed to keep doing all the stuff that we got wrong. You're supposed to do better. That's why you have scripture. We need to teach our students to see the imperfections that are revealed in scripture, even in the prophets, and then to do better. And how do we know what standard do we use that we're not just being random in our, or just critical or cynical all the time? We are the church of Jesus Christ. We read the scriptures through the life ministry, atonement, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the North Star, not Captain Moroni, not Nephi, not anybody else, Jesus Christ. So we read the war chapters through the gospel of Jesus Christ, not the other way around. We read the Nephi Laban story through the gospel of Jesus Christ, not the other way around. So when we, we have to teach our students to apply Jesus to all of the scriptures and to see Jesus, which means that we might have to read critically because Moroni invites us to. We might have to say what's going on in the scriptures at any given moment is, does not live up to the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we are called to do better. We are called to learn from these scriptures and do better. Why? Because we are called to be peacemakers. And I'll close with this from President Nelson, general conference address that he gave about 20 years ago. This is what President then Elder Nelson said. He said, peace is possible. It is a prime priority that pleads for our pursuit. How's that for alliteration? The descendants of Abraham, if we believe that we are Israel, and trusted with great promises of infinite influence are in a pivotal position to emerge as peacemakers. Chosen by the Almighty, they can direct their powerful potential toward peace. Peacemakers could lead in the art of arbitration, give relief to the needy, bring hope to those who fear. Of such patriots, future generations would shout praises and our eternal God would pass judgments of glory. Peacemakers are patriots. As a church, we must renounce war and proclaim peace. As individuals, we should follow after the things which make for peace. We should be personal peacemakers. We should live peacefully as couples, families, and neighbors. So that's where I've got, I mean, a lot of this comes from, uh, from, from this book uh, that I published, Mormonism and Violence. Uh, as was mentioned, I have a book coming out this fall with David Pulsifer. Uh, which really uh, tries to outline a scriptural theology of nonviolence. We dig deep into Restoration Scripture, uh, especially in the Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants, uh, to, to talk about a lot of the principles that I've talked about today. So uh, thank you for your patience, uh, and I'm looking forward to the, to the conversation. All right, that was awesome. Uh, what a wonderful way to wrap up that message with uh, Jesus Christ as the Prince of Peace. Now, there were several questions that were given in the chat as you were going, and some of them seem to have been answered. But uh, for those of you who have questions, please put those in the chat now. Um, for those who are members of the training council, let's just kind of round robin this as you see a question that, that you feel like is relevant. Will you pull that out and we'll just kind of take turns reading these and and we've got 30 minutes. Is that OK, Patrick? We got 30 more minutes with you. Absolutely. Yep. So I'm, I'm going to start it off if the other members of the training council will just start kind of looking as the questions start coming in. This is a question I think we're going to battle all week, um, starting here with with this question of violence and then tomorrow with plural marriage and then the next day with race and the priesthood. So. Brother Mason, with your perspective, 
Uh, we are taught that God, this is from Caleb Ware, we are taught that God will not le let a prophet lead us astray. And then we see accounts of Brigham Young saying that we must kill the Utes or that they will kill us or that he will kill people with a Bowie knife. How, how do these two ideas fit together? So this is a question about prophetic fallibility. How, how do you approach that from a scholarly point of view? How do you approach that with a disciple point of view? Yeah, you're exactly right. This is the million dollar question. I believe this is one of the most important theological questions that we as saints have to grapple with uh, right now. Because um, uh, I, I think we have not done the necessary work to grapple with it. Um, okay, so first of all, the scriptures are abundantly clear that we do not believe in prophetic infallibility. It is not a doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do not believe that our prophets are inerrant. We do not believe that the words that they say are perfect or can or that they can never err. We do not believe that. The scriptures are clear about this. I just read Mormon chapter 9, section 1 of the Doctrine and Covenants uh, is amply clear about this. Uh, I, could, I could go on and on. Uh, the, the, the scriptural record is quite clear about this. Just read the Old Testament, right? Um, but um, but we also maintain that God calls prophets and apostles, and we lift our arm to the square to regularly sustain them as prophets, seers, and revelators. And we believe that the words that they teach uh, are revelations uh, from God. Not every word they teach, right? And so this is so this, this is what has to happen, and Brigham Young and actually all of the prophets have taught this. They, they tell the saints not to take their word for granted, but, but to receive confirmation from the Holy Spirit of their words. And so we are, God's not interested in making robots. God's interested in making disciples and in ultimately making gods. That means that we have to hone and develop our own gift of discernment. And one of the parts, one of the things uh, that uh, is a gift about the gift of prophets and apostles is it helps us, dis helps us refine our sense of discernment. How do we learn to trust? Uh, how do we learn to follow? Well, we do so through uh, exercising the gift of the Holy Ghost that's been given to us so that we can know what teachings are true. Uh, now, I think when you look at the, the record, the overall record of the teachings of the prophets and apostles of this, dis this dispensation, it is a strong record, right? Uh, it is not an infallible and perfect record, but it is a strong record of men who have been called and have successfully testified of Jesus Christ and his gospel. So they are reliable guides in a life of faith. But we don't look to the prophets for our salvation. This is not the church of Joseph Smith. It's not the church of Russell Nelson or the church of Moses. This is the church of Jesus Christ. So the prophets and apostles are sent as witnesses of the light, not as the light themselves. And so we don't look to the prophets for our salvation. We look with the prophets to the author and finisher of our faith. We look with the prophets to uh, the source of our salvation. And so they are as accountable to Jesus Christ as we are. And so it is ultimately that that's why I talk about this Christocentric hermeneutic that, that that we that we understand as disciples of Jesus Christ that it is the ministry, the life, the teachings, the atonement of Jesus that become the standard by which we understand all things. So um, you know, the, the the Lord told the church in section 21, he told them to sustain and, and follow the words and hearken to the words of Joseph Smith in all patience and faith. And, and that becomes the dynamic. We, we do it in all faith, but we also do it in patience, recognizing, uh, as David O. McKay taught, that when God makes the prophet, he does not unmake the man. Uh, so he, he does not rob them of their agency any more than he robs us of our agency. And this is, the, this is part of the process. And so in some ways, it would be easier just to salute and be robots. But again, God doesn't want to make robots. Uh, he, he, expects, he expects us to work out our own salvation, and that includes... Uh, how we understand and what it means to follow the, the, the words of, of prophets that we believe are reliable and are called as witnesses, but are not perfect. Uh, so this is, it's, it's harder to do that, right? It's, it's, it's hard to figure this stuff out. Um, it makes our brains hurt sometimes. It makes our hearts hurt sometimes. Uh, but that's, that's, the, that's the path that we voted for. That's the plan we voted for. We didn't vote for the easy plan. That was somebody else's plan in the council in heaven. 
We voted for the messy plan, the hard plan, the complex plan that required redemption for all of us. Uh, and um, last thing I'll say is that we believe in a gospel of eternal progression. And so uh, we need to let uh, our past leaders and current people to, to, to do better. Uh, I am convinced that Brigham Young is not sitting up in spirit paradise or wherever he is saying the same old racist things he said in 1852 or saying the same things about Indians or, or calling for war. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that Brigham Young has learned some things over the past century and a half as part of his eternal progression. So let's let him progress. Uh, let's, let's let our past leaders progress just and show them the kind of generosity uh, that, uh, that, that we would hope that, uh, that, that would be shown toward, towards us. So that, look, it's, this is a hugely complex topic, um, uh, but, but, but I think we, 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 we just have to keep wrestling with it. And, and, and different people are gonna come up with, with slightly different ways of, uh, you know, of where they feel comfortable on this. Um, but, but, uh, but I think some of the core doctrines um, that have been revealed to us are, are pretty clear. Great. Uh, Caleb, do you want a follow-up question on that, or is that good? Oh, that was good. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, Ke Kevin, looks like you got yours unmuted. Yeah, Patrick, I have, I have some questions for you. You um, tipped your hand uh, in what you were sharing with us about 3 Nephi 9 and the destruction that takes place there. I'm, I'm curious um, why you find that so, what word should I use, disturbing? in light of the whole scriptural context of God. Um, you know, even back in when he's making the covenant with Abraham, hey, you can't have this land yet because the Amorites are not full in iniquity yet. And so God has his rules. We, I, I again, God taking people off the earth through a flood or through fire with the second coming to me, this mortal state isn't it. I mean, it's the people who died in the flood. Great. They get to be taught later. It's okay. <laughs> you know, I, I, tell me why you're so, your feelings about third Nephi nine. That was interesting. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you, you're, and you're exactly right. Actually, you put your finger on one of the most important parts of it is that uh, if I really believe in the resurrection, right. I, if, if I really believe in that, then um then who lives, who dies, when, you know, all the, 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 this mortal probation is not it, especially with our understanding of, of the gospel, of the plan of salvation, right, that, uh, that redemption continues uh, in, in, in the next world. So, so you're exactly right. So in an ultimate sense, I'm not particularly troubled by it. And the, um, but I am, uh, I, I think I, I'm troubled um, for a couple of different reasons. One is that, um, I think this this is a hard thing for lots of, of of readers, right? They say, "Wait a minute! I thought God is love, right? Uh, I thought that Jesus was, was the Prince of Peace." This doesn't make sense to me why God is killing people, especially sometimes over like, um, and, and oftentimes the question is formulated this way: like, um, okay, like let's, let's take Ananias and Sapphira, right? Okay, so they held some things back; they weren't fully honest, all this kind of stuff. Like, God didn't reach down and kill Hitler, right? I mean, there, there are a lot of people who have done a lot of worse things than seemingly what, um, you know, the, the, the reasons why God has killed, you know, steadying the ark and things like this. So, so part of it is what seems to be a kind of inscrutable logic of, of why God chooses to intervene with that kind of uh, fa fatal violence that doesn't seem to make any sense. And, and we could say, well, God's ways are not our ways. And I think we have to lean on that. And, and ultimately that's true. Um, but we also still want to try and make some sense of it. What the, ultimately, the way that I make sense of Third Nephi nine, and not everybody's going to agree with me. And actually, a lot of my friends who are um, a really committed pacifists uh, don't like this interpretation that I'm going to give. Is that it seems to me that the Book of Mormon makes a distinction between the condescended God and the ascended God. Um, that uh, the condescended God being Jesus in the flesh. And what manner of man ought we to be? We're supposed to be like Jesus. And, and so I don't see anywhere where, where Jesus gives us license uh, for ourselves to commit, uh, to commit violence. And, and this is partly me wanting to, to hold off the, the crack hour argument. 
the religion is inherently dangerous, the revealed religion is inherently dangerous because you never know what God's going to tell you, right? And, and what I want to say back is, no, God has told us he's revealed exactly what God is like in the flesh, in mortality, and that's Jesus, who lived a perfectly nonviolent life. And that is the example we're to follow. Now, the ascended God has a different kind of moral calculus, partly because he has the power of resurrection, right? He can make, if, 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 I, if I commit violence against somebody, especially if I kill somebody, I can't make that right. I can't, there's no way that I can reconcile that. There's no way I can bring that back. It, it, that is the reason why it's the ultimate sin. There's nothing I can do to reconcile that. that God has to do it. God, on the other hand, has provided for reconciliation of that through the resurrection. So the ascended God, the glorified God, to, to me, there is a, a kind of moral, even if we believe we're in the same species because of Mormon theology, there does seem to be a kind of ethical or moral distinction between what we are, what we do here in mortality with our limited view, our finite view. The other thing is God has eternal perspective. We don't. And so it's, it seems to me that, that we are... Um, you know, Paul talks about this life, you know, this is a kind of a, a schooling uh, uh, for us. Uh, so I don't, you know, we're not given the keys to the whole car, right, or, or, or to everything. So, so I think God does have a different kind of moral calculus uh, than, than we are. So, so while I, I find 3 Nephi 9 a difficult chapter to read, I also recognize that, that, that God is in a different place with a different perspective, with a different power to make right what is wrong. Than, than, than I do, so. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think I think that's a good perspective, right? Because, yep, I love how you stated that. Murder's here because I can't make that up, but God can. Yeah. Um, I Thanks. saw James unmute. James, your question? Yeah. We have a question from Mark Nielsen. He uh, says, many American members of the church our students and Christians in general are very proud of their patriotism, Second Amendment rights, serving our country and dying to defend our freedom. This year, we had people storming the Capitol with for religious reasons. And, and what about uh, the Revolutionary War? How do we reconcile religious freedom, Second Amendment rights, the Revolutionary War, Civil War, and Christ-like peace? That's the question. That is the question. And, 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 and I hope that that's the question that we challenge each of our students to think through. Uh, so I, I've come to my own set of answers. Um, I, I'm deeply committed to, to nonviolence on a personal level, not in spite of my faith in Jesus, but because of it. Um, I don't, I honestly don't know how you carry the cross of Jesus and storm the Capitol on January 6th. I, I, I don't know how you do that. Um, and so maybe I need to, to learn more and be more generous uh, to, to other people. Um, I, I don't know how you connect those dots. Well, I, I, I know how theoretically, because I've read enough and, and so forth, but, but I viscerally, and in terms of my discipleship, I don't know how you connect the dots in, in that way. Um, uh, so I, I think this is the question that every disciple of Jesus has to ask. And, and I think as gospel educators, our job isn't to make up other people's minds. Our, our job is to teach the doctrine, to teach the scriptures, to, to, to lay it out, and then people have to make discernments. And it may be that in this life, as we see through a glass darkly, as we are on this side of the veil, as we all live, live this sort of celestial, terrestrial existence, it may be that different people come up with, with, with uh, different answers in terms of the way they uh, live out uh, these things, not the basic principles. I mean, I have lots of friends, oh, lots of, e even though I'm committed to nonviolence and consider myself a pacifist, I have lots of good friends who are in the military or in the national, who work for in the national security apparatus, and they do so from a position of deep Latter-day Saint faith, and they have thought through this stuff, and they are committed to be peacemakers, right? So, so at no point does a Christian get to get off the hook and say, no, nah, peacemaking, not for me. Right? I, I don't think there's any way that you can dismiss that. But I, there are a lot of serious and sincere and faithful Latter-day Saints who have said, I am a peacemaker. I also live in this wicked world. And, and this is one of the ways that, that, that I'm going to do this in a kind of Captain Moroni way. Right. Um, and so that, that's and I think that's what the Book of Mormon does is it gives us these options side by side. 
the anti-Nephi-Lehi option and the Captain Moroni option are put side by side. Both of them seem to be approved, right? Uh, section 98 does allow for disciples of Jesus. They can renounce war and proclaim peace and still be justified under certain very strict conditions to, to take up arms in self-defense. So, um, uh, so, so I think we have to make room for the people who, who come to conclusions like I do, that, that their Christianity is gonna lead them to a kind of personal pacifism. But I think we also have to make room for people who take their Christianity equally seriously. I don't think we let people off the hook with Christianity, right? I think we need to, like, how are you being a peacemaker, right? How does, you know, picking up a gun, how, how, do, how does that connect to peacemaking? So I think we can ask those kinds of questions, but, but I know lots of good, sincere, faithful people who come to different conclusions than, than I do, and, and, and I'm okay with that. I, I appreciate that, in essence, echoing the words of ancient modern prophets of teach correct principles and then let them govern themselves and exercise their, their moral agency. So thank you so much for that. Yeah. Mark, was there a follow-up to that that you wanted to give? No, no. Thank you so much, um, Brother Mason. I appreciate it. Um, let's see, Greg or Brad or Trent, is there a question that you see? I've got one if you don't. It looks like Tom Gibbons Given, wants to know more about blood atonement. Did Brigham Young teach blood atonement and any insight you'd have there? Yes, he did repeatedly, as did other leaders of the church and members of the First Presidency and, and other apostles. Uh, it, it was taught repeatedly from general conference and in local congregations, um, especially in this period of, of the mid 1850s. Um, this is also about the same time Brigham Young was also teaching the Adam God theory. He continued to teach it off and on throughout the rest of his life. Uh, that's another instance where I think the membership of the church received that uh, supposed doctrine with a collective shrug. Um, uh, and so this is an instance, I think, I actually think that this is one, when, when I talk about prophetic fallibility um, and the kind of checks on, on this, I think that the membership of the church has uh, through our own collective discernment, sometimes we vote with our feet. Uh, and those are instances in the 1850s, at least, where, where Brigham Young was introducing and preaching doctrines to the church that the membership, the, the spirit did not ratify those teachings uh, among the membership of the church. And uh, you didn't get a lot of people openly denouncing him for it, a, a, a few did, um, but mostly just people said, not so sure. And, 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 and the church moved on. And, uh, and I see that as, as the spirit uh, moving upon the church to, to correct, um, you know, uh, to, to, to correct, I, I think where Brigham Young was, was a little uh, or a lot wrong. Thank you. Also, would you add anything as far as the temple rites and rituals over time, connecting blood atonement, connecting violence? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, it, 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 they, they, um, the oath of vengeance was not originally part of the endowment ceremony. It was added to the endowment ceremony after Joseph Smith was killed. Um, and, and again, I understand, I mean, look, I mean, the prophet of the restoration was martyred. Uh, and so there's a collective grief. And there's lots of talk in scriptures about, you know, a God avenging the blood of the prophets. I mean, that's one of the main reasons given in 3 Nephi 9, actually. Um, and that was, and, and this is one of the things where critics of the church oftentimes got it wrong. They thought the Latter-day Saints had taken an oath to avenge the blood of the prophets. In fact, the, the, the oath was, was simply, um, uh, or, 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 or the prayer was that God would avenge uh, the blood of the prophets. That's a, that's a distinction. That eventually gets removed in the uh, early 20th century. I forget exactly what year um, that's, that's removed. Um, and, and, and so we see this as part of the temple ceremony. And we, you know, we see this as part of the ongoing restoration is that we continue to learn and grow. Um, either we make mistakes and, and then uh, correct them later, or maybe some teachings were appropriate at a certain time and, and, then, and then outlive their usefulness at, at a later time. There's different ways to think about this. Um, but I, I personally see that as an expression of the collective grief of the saints. Um, and, and, and a cry for justice uh, that they had not received um, and, and, a, and an appeal to God for, for divine justice. Um, and uh, 
uh, and, and, and then again, that, that outlived its, its utility. All right, Thank we, you. Have, we have room for probably one more question. Let's go with Nikki's question there. Um, as she asks in a new awareness of section 103 and with little understanding of curses, verses 24 and 25, even those given up by auth authorized servants, what can we do to stand up to our enemies while keeping the covenant, thinking of students who have been treated violently by family, friends, and people? What can we do for them and, and their feelings of belonging? And we should probably combine that with uh, Mason's question about what do you say to a student who just doesn't feel like this type of topic is relevant? So these are both kind of student relevancy type questions. Yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, yeah, we are, um, uh, we, I, I think many of us are blessed uh, in, in that uh, our lives have not been significantly impacted directly by violence. Certainly that's true for me. Uh, even while, you know, the nation's been at war for most of the past two decades, that's barely touched me. You know, it's been fought on foreign soil. Nobody I know, you know, has died in those wars and, and so forth. So my life is relatively untouched by this. Um, and, and so I could see a lot of students saying, ah, this, 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 this stuff doesn't, doesn't matter much to me. I think there's there's relevance in a couple of different ways. One is that is that the world is still a world of violence and will continue to be. I mean, all the prophecies are that uh, if anything, violence will increase, not decrease, uh, uh, as we uh, as we get closer to to the second coming. And part of what we do as saints is we prepare for for what may happen in the future. So, and, and this is what we teach our students all the time, right? You, you, you don't just wait until the moment of temptation or the moment of crisis to then think about something for the first time, right? You prepare yourself so that when that moment of trial comes, you have oil in the lamp, so to speak. You've already thought through these things sufficiently so that you, you know, think you know what you're going to do, at least when, when that moment of crisis comes. So there's something to be said about that. Also, as an act of charity and empathy that a lot of our sisters and brothers around the world do live in places of violence. And this is very real, uh, whether members of the church or not. But violence is, is a very real part. And, and frankly, it's, it's a part of this country. Uh, in May, just last month, there were over 60 mass shootings in this country. So while our students may be insulated and while i may be insulated from this for lots of different reasons race being a, a, a part of it uh economics being a part of it um nobody is is perfectly immune right i mean you know these these kids live grow up in a, in a time of school shootings where they have they have drills uh, you know every few months in terms of what to do in, in the case of an active shooter so um uh so so this is this is not just theoretical um, the, the other thing is that, um, yeah, so even if it's not violence, I think we all have to think about how do we deal with opposition? How do we deal with, with persecution of different forms? Now we don't experience the kind of persecution that they did in Missouri. We're not, nobody's being driven from their homes because they're a Mormon. Nobody's being raped because they're a Mormon, uh, th these kinds of things. Okay. Um, but, but a lot of people do experience opposition because of their faith. And I think we have to think about what, how we're going to handle that. And I think we, um, I, th I think we turn to the, the Sermon on the Mount. What does it mean to be a peacemaker in your school? What does it mean to, you know, when somebody says horrible things about you and your faith, what, what does it mean to pray for those who persecute you, to bless those who curse you? Right? They, they may not be explicitly violent about it, but what, is, what does it mean when people are really nasty towards you? Um, lots of people, um, unfortunately, you know, domestic abuse and all kinds of things, you know, there's a lot of violence that happens behind closed doors. Um, and I think we have to, to think about that in, in our ministry as well. But, but fundamentally, we, we have to think about what does it mean to follow Jesus in, in a world that is hard, in, 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 in a world where... Um, a world that, that that will be a difficult place for saints to live in. And for me, at least, uh, it's a sobering thing. And, and I'll close on this. But I always have to remember, and this is, this is a hard lesson to teach, especially to teenagers or really to anybody, that um, how did Jesus respond to the persecution and opposition that he received? 
He was crucified. He didn't fight back. He could have. He said in the garden, he said, I could summon legions of angels if I wanted to. But he told Peter, he said, put down your sword. And Jesus went willingly to the cross. Now, we could say he had to. It was part of the atonement. It was part of his mission. But he told his followers the same thing. He said, if you're going to follow me, you're going to walk the path of the cross. Now, for some of those followers, it was the actual path. We know that some of them were crucified and so forth. But, but what it means to follow Jesus is to take up the cross. And uh, the cross is a symbol of violence. The, the cross is a symbol of unjust, unfair treatment of an innocent victim. And so I think for all of our students, whether or not they're going to ever encounter violence in their lives or not, I think we have to teach them that to be a disciple of Jesus means partly how you're going to carry the cross. Will you carry it? And then how will you carry it? Jesus carried it to his crucifixion because of his faith in the resurrection. He knew that he would be raised on the third day. Do we believe that? Do we believe that God will fight our battles or do we feel like we have to fight them ourselves? Uh, the early saints believed that God would fight their battles and then they, you know, it, it, again, it gets hard. It's, it's, it's not fun to be punched in the face. And, and so they turned to self-defense and maybe that was the right thing to do. Um, but uh, but I, I think this is what we need to do as gospel educators to recognize the relevance of this. Again, maybe not, you know, the, some of the specifics uh, of, of, of violence, but to think about what does it mean to carry the cross of Jesus and, and how will we do so? All right. <clears throat> well, our time is well spent. Um, in 30 seconds, could you tell us, this is for Tim Sharp, resources for where he can get additional information on the history of Oath, uh, Oath of Vengeance or Blood Atonement. He just wants some additional. You got books off. The yeah. Top. So, I mean, if, if you want just a, a, a pretty brief treatment of it, I mean, I, I don't want to plug my my own book, but you can get some of the, the basics here in, in this book, Mormonism and Violence. And, and then you can look at the footnotes that, that point you to other things. There have been some some good essays um, there was a there was there was a good essay on blood atonement by in, in the Journal of Mormon History a few years ago, and I'm totally blanking on the name of the author just because I'll, I'll remember it as soon as we hang up. Um, but the Journal of Mormon History has had some good stuff on blood atonement. Um, the the um, the Temple Oath uh, and and the history there obviously it's a little trickier um, uh, because of the sensitivities around the the, the temple. Um, the, uh, but there have been historians that have, that have studied it. Uh, there's a historian named David Berger. Uh, he has a book called The Mysteries of Godliness, uh, where he traces the, the history and the development of, of the temple ceremonies. Uh, I think he does so mostly in a sensitive and fair way. Some people might think he crosses some lines, um, but that's uh, just the temple is a difficult subject to talk about as a historian um, to, to, be, uh, to be sensitive. So th there are some, some, some resources um, to go to. One thing that you can do, uh, one resource anytime you're studying Mormon history, by the way, um, is uh, BYU. Uh, the BYU Library hosts a database. It's called Studies in Mormon History. Which in, in, in scholarship, we still use the M word. I know we're discouraged from doing that as, as uh, church members. Uh, but if, if you go to studies in, in Mormon history, uh, it, it's, it's a part of the BYU website. You can search any topic. They have a great sort of keyword search and things like that. And you can track down uh, the scholarship uh, on, on any given. So you could just type in blood atonement or you could type in, you know, Oath of Vengeance or something like that. And, and it would pull up the relevant articles or books uh, for you. So that's, that's a really good resource. Right. Brother Mason, we we express our our love for you, for your your scholarship, and for your discipleship. This has been this has been really wonderful, and you have stated uh, you're willing to share your your slides with us. Yeah, absolutely. So should I just send that to you? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, and then I'll 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 make a link for this video and the slides and make this available to everybody. So that's great. And then if anybody has specific questions, if you want to hunt down some sources or something like that. Uh, feel free to, to email me. I mean, I'm easy to find. I'm just patrick.mason at usu.edu. Uh, email me if you ever have questions about sources or some of the specifics of, the, of this history. Awesome. We, we love you very much. We appreciate 
your time and your effort. Uh, for everybody else, you got 30 minutes to get to the building. Thank you. We love you. Uh, we appreciate your morning. Have, have a good day. Great. Thanks. You too. Take care, everybody.